Hey, y'all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Episode 4. So many things to love about this episode. I spoke with Sean Yadnicek, author of the Bio-Integrated Farm from Chelsea Green, who's now farming at Wild Hope Farm in Chester, South Carolina. Sean's doing a lot of really interesting work with cover crops on raised beds, and we get into all that, as well as one really cool innovation he's added to the roller crimper system. And I would <clears throat> leaf it there, but I want to add that we are four episodes in, and we've seen four totally different styles and scales of no-till market gardening, but there is no sign of that changing. As far as the podcast goes, the interviews I banked, i.e. those you haven't heard yet, are with more people using more unique techniques. So if I may editorialize on that for a second, what I'm noticing in these interviews is a sort of multiple discovery or simultaneous invention theory, where in the same way that two scientists may come up with a similar theory at the same time in two different places, we're finding a lot of different growers have developed a lot of different no-till systems simultaneously, but more or less independent of one another. And it has led to a lot of variation, innovation, and some really interesting techniques. In short, going into this, I kind of thought, I don't know, it'd be hard to find a bunch of no-till market gardeners to interview and that they would all be doing more or less the same thing anyway. I have probably never been so wrong about anything. I mean, if the interviews I've done are any indication, we're just getting started, y'all. Anyway, with that, let's hear about yet another really interesting style with Sean Yadnicek of Wild Hope Farm. Sean Yadnicek, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me here. This is exciting. Well, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to have you. Very, I was a very big fan of the Biointegrated Farm. I thought that was a great book. Thanks. Yeah, I think it has a, it's a good resource. Definitely. So you were at Clemson for a little bit uh, at the university, and but you've since moved on. Can you tell us a little bit about Wild Hope Farm and what you do there? Sort of how, and then a little bit about the farm, like how much is under cultivation and uh, what you all do with the produce. Yeah, so Wild Hope Farm, we're south of Charlotte in a town called Chester, South Carolina. And the farm itself is about 220 acres. And right now we have about three and a half acres under cultivation and then um, additional two and a half acres cover cropped with um, chickens uh, pasturing through it. And we're in the process, we're a startup farm. So this is, a, we're, this is actually, we've only been going for about a year and a half now. And um, we're looking to scale up um, pretty drastically. Our, our goal is to be 11 acres after three or four years. And um, so next year we're bringing on two and a half more acres. So we'll have six acres in production um, next year. And our main markets are CSA program. Uh, we basically grew about 100 share equivalents uh, this year. Um, we didn't sell that many. So some of it went to a farmer's market and uh, some went to restaurants as well. How many farmers markets are you all doing? We're just doing, uh, currently doing one farmers market right now in Matthews, North Carolina. Okay. So is the entire farm in no-till? No, that's a good question. Um, we do, we, we basically, this year we did a little over 50% of our production was in no-till. Um, it's uh, difficult to do everything in no-till, uh, but we do as much as we can um, using a roller crimper. And I've kind of developed some new techniques that allow me to expand what we can do with a roller crimper. So it allows me to grow. Um, traditionally, I guess I started out with a roller crimper about five years ago and just started doing winter squash was the only was what I started with and actually had a uh, roller crimper on the back on the well, front of a um, walk behind tractor. It's a Grillo. Uh, we now have a BCS, and now I have you know multiple big tractors. But um, yeah, it started with the the Grillo, and the and I guess the roller crimper came from Earth Tools. Is one of the ones that they manufactured, and you have to basically load it up with uh, dumbbell weights to get the weight that you need. But um, yeah, kind of started with that and a little probably quarter acre patch of, uh, I did, I think I did the first year I did rye and vetch. And I remember the vetch didn't die from the crimping because they both mature at a different time period. So the vetch didn't die, but we were still successful. We had to go out there and weed eat the vetch to keep it from going to seed. But 
still worked. And um, ever since that first year with the roller crimper, we've just expanded our production. Now we do, uh, let's see, we do all of our winter squash with the, with the roller crimper. We do um, uh, a second succession of tomatoes, no-till with the roller crimper. We do um, all of our peppers, all of our eggplant. Um, we do two successions of watermelons. Um, two successions of cantaloupes, um, second succession of summer squash, second succession of cucumbers, and um, I, this year I did some beans direct seeded in, in no-till, and then um, all of our sweet potatoes are also done no-till. We do um, our second and third succession of uh, green onions or scallions, um, also did a bunch of flowers in no-till as well, so we're just kind of do as much as we can and so may it saves so much time and it uh it's just amazing how how easy it makes farming so um I'm, I'm constantly just every year i've just been doing more and more with it can you talk a little bit about how effective that roller crimper was from earth tools um it was very effective it was a little squirming i guess you could call it it was hard to control on the front of the tractor now with the we're using it with a grillo and the way it was attached to the grill, it wasn't like directly in front of it. It had to be kind of cocked slightly sideways, um, which made it a little more difficult to control. Um, but it it was definitely very effective. I mean, it had the weight that, that you needed. Um, and, you know, you could easily do, you know, I mean, uh, you could probably do up to an acre, I'd say, no problem with one of those or even more. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really good tool. Now we do all of our no-till on raised beds. So I don't think it would be effective on the raised beds because um, uh, when you're doing it on raised beds, I, you know, I've seen some raised beds, ra specific crimpers designed for raised beds and they have these little, I guess they're in sections where you have a crimper on top and you've got crimpers on the sides of the raised beds. But the way I've been doing is I've just been using a normal crimper and the tires do a, a good job in the furrows and then the the actual roller crimper gets to the top of the bed but i don't know if a if a walk behind would actually work in those furrow areas if you could get it to work i've never tried the walk behind on the raised beds because i kind of developed that technique once we had the other roller crimper um, that that basically goes on three-point hitch of the rear of the tractor originally wanted to get one for the front of the tractor and I wasn't sure because everyone said that you know you need it on the front of the tractor because it's not going to work unless you do that but um you got it for the rear of the tractor it's been working great I basically do do two passes um and and that knocks the ryegrass down and, and kills it can you give us a, a kind of breakdown of what that that uh, roller crimper looks like. It has a sort of specific design, right? Like that Chevron, I think of the, the Jeff Moyer design. Is it is it similar to that? Yep, it's made by I&J manufacturers. I think they're up in Pennsylvania. Um, I think it was d designed by Jeff Moyer um, and, and, and one of his friends or neighbors. And yep, it's just got that Chevron pattern on it. And you, you weight it down with water can't remember how much water I put in. I have to look that up every year. Um, you you got to get the right amount of weight on there. And then... Um, oh, okay. So you put the water on top or you put it into the... Into implement? the implement, yep. It's got a little, you know, plug that you unscrew and then, yep, fill it up with water. If it's too heavy, it um, ends up cutting the ryegrass, um, which is not beneficial because then it's more likely to re-sprout, I think. So you want it to pinch and crimp the stems, but not actually cut through it. So I really want to get into how that roller crimper system has evolved. Uh, and I also want to emphasize, you know, you definitely can never get overly nerdy here. So feel free to, to get into the minutia. Um, there is no governor on the ner nerdiness here. Uh, so, okay, great. So, Love it. Um, so, but first maybe we can kind of talk a little bit about, uh, how you break ground, how you build those beds, and um, and then how you seed them. Yeah, that's, those are good questions. Yeah, so, I mean, before you do no-till, you definitely need to get all your weeds under control. So, for example, um, and that just depends on what you do, depends on what, what weeds you have existing in that field. Um, so the field we started with, uh, 
our, our first year at Wild Hope, it was basically a Bermuda grass hay field. So I don't know if, you're, any, if your listeners are familiar with Bermuda grass, but it's probably one of the worst weeds you could potentially have on a farm. Um, it's a perennial, very aggressive, sm- uh, spreads by uh, above ground and below ground stems and seeds. It's just very tenacious and difficult to get rid of, but um, definitely possible to get rid of it or- organically. So the way I did that is uh, dissed it four times in May, um, pretty much as early as you can get into the field. Uh, you want to get out there and start disking it. Ideally, you want to disc it during a dry period. So you're basically bringing up those rhizomes and drying it out and kind of weakening the plant. And then for Bermuda grass, it hates shade. So um, after those four discings, I um, uh, planted a cover crop of Sudex and cowpeas into it. And Sudex is um, a hybrid between uh, sorghum and Sudan grass. It gets very tall. It emits these chemicals through its roots that have an allelopathic effect, which is kind of like an herbicidal effect. So it um, prevents seeds from germinating and has a very deep root system, so it helps break the soil up. And then it provides a massive amount of shade. And then the, the cowpeas also help shade out the Bermuda grass, and they, they're a nitrogen fixer. So they're going to help um, for, provide some fertility, but they both provide a massive amount of organic matter. I think I ca- calculated we we were able to um, put a, a, I think the cover crop was equivalent to about applying 20 tons of organic matter per acre um, over the year. So, uh, and seeding the cover crop, it's important to basically plant it into moisture. So you do your last tilling. Um, Last tilling, uh, before you plant, you want it to be like a light tilling and you want the soil to be just dry enough to do your tillage operation. And then um, and then plant your seed into moisture. And we uh, hired a neighbor to come over who had a no-till drill and he um, drilled that cover crop into the moisture. There weren't any beds made at this time period. Okay, so you're, so you're tilling out the crop, you, you, you basically tilled out your cover crop and while the ground is still moist but not super moist you're you're drilling a seed instead of broadcasting it yeah and i've I've, in the past i've i've broadcasted and and then um disc the disc the seeds in like if you have a disc hair you can um and you can adjust your disc hair so that the discs run parallel you can that's another way you, you can get the seeds in i've also taken a drag hair over it to incorporate the seeds I've done it different ways. It just depends on what tools you have. And um, I actually had all that done before we even arrived at the farm. So I knew I was gonna start the job here and I wanted to get rid of the weeds before I even came here. So I hired the, hired the neighbor to do the disking of the Bermuda grass. And then after disking the Bermuda grass, he planted the, um, the Sudex and cowpeas. And then I, when I arrived, the Sudex and cowpeas are about four feet tall. And then I mowed them down um, to about a foot. And then we got about four mowings the first year on, on that Sudex and cowpea cover crop. And then once you mow it, it basically forces the roots to go deeper into the soil. And you're just covering the soil with that layer of organic matter. And so you, you get a more overall biomass with the, with the multiple mowings. And then you don't want it to go to seed too or get too woody. Um, so just, yeah, that first year, the Sudex and the cowpeas, just get rid of all your weed problems. And then um, kind of got rid of about 98%, maybe 99% of the Bermuda grass. Um, and we did about three quarters acres of production that first year, mainly garlic um, that fall. So some of that Sudex was terminated early um, and that was all just done with tillage. But then, so then that, after the Sudex cowpea cover crop, then we planted, um, then I dissed all that in, made um, raised beds in the field, and then I planted uh, a cover crop of cereal rye. And I like to use this variety called a uh, Renz Abruzzi, and it matures a little bit earlier, and it's, it's taller, so I think it produces a little more biomass than some of the other cereal ryes. And um, that grew through the winter time on top of the raised beds. And the way I, I plant the cover crop on the raised beds is I'll just broadcast it um, with like a 
cone spreader. I don't know. It's one of those uh, cone shaped spreaders that goes on the back of your tractor. It's uh, attaches to your PTO. Okay. And it kind of shoots it out in a circle, a half circle. Yeah, but exactly. So you can plant a mass of, you know, you could plant five acres in probably a couple hours. Um, and that's just spits it out. Um, and in the past, I've also, and this year I did it as well. This, this winter, this is our second winter. I, I added crimson clover to it. And crimson clover is a good one to add to the, to the ryegrass because they both mature at the same time. So when I was telling you about the vetch problem, the vetch matures at a later date than the ryegrass. Um, so if you have to crimp the, the crop at the, at the right maturity stage, so the, the crimson clover and the cereal rye both mature at the right stage. So when you crimp them, they're both going to stay down. What did you use to, to shape those bed, those, uh, beds? Yeah, I used, um, a bed shaper from Buckeye tractor. It's basically got, you know, several discs that pull the soil, uh, into the middle of the tractor area and then it has a shaper pan that basically shapes it into a raised bed and then it also has sweeps and these things called side wings that help um, form the furrows as well so it's just a single pass and and then you've got beds yep you got a raised bed sometimes it takes a couple passes to get the bed to form just depends on you know your soil has to be dissed up fairly well and loose um, and then, yeah, so form the raised beds after you disc it up and then, um, broadcast the cover crop seed. And then I take the bed shaper and I go back over with the bed shaper and that kind of presses the seeds and helps incorporate it. Um, so you get better seed soil contact and helps cover the seeds a little better. So that's kind of an important step, um, to planting the, the cover crops on the raised beds. But I think, you know, planting cover crops on the raised beds, my experience, the cover crops do better. I mean, you have better drainage, the cover crops are going to grow better. And then um, you also have, I think, better soil heat because you have all those edges. So the, the sun, you know, is hitting the soil at different angles. So I think the soil heats up better, which tends to give you an earlier maturing cover crop as well, which is important with um, organic no-till with the crimper. You want it to mature as early as possible. So I think it helps with some earliness. And then um, the, the cover crops, I've done some side-by-side compa -side comparisons in the past, and then it just seems like the cover crops are always bigger and better on raised beds, which is key to doing the, um, the no-till as well. Interesting, yeah, I guess I didn't think about you, you you had to choose raised beds because you could have just, if you're just doing a, a straight cover crop and then no-till system, you could have easily done that in, in flat ground. But you think that there's actually an advantage to having it on the raised beds. A huge advantage. And yeah, I don't, I mean, I know that some people are, a few people are doing it with those other crimpers, but I, I think I was the first person to do it with the, um, with just a normal crimper. And uh, I don't know what made me, made me try it, but um, definitely works. Um, sometimes you might have to like, you know, make sure the tires get those furrows if any pops up in the furrow areas on the sides of the, of the raised beds. But, um, as long as you get your timing right and, and do it at the right maturity stage, um, uh, everything seems to stay down, um, really well. So the key is, is to run that roller crimper over it when, when your ryegrass is in like the milk stage. If you do it earlier than that, it's going to, potentially pop up. Um, if you do it in the dough stage or later, then it, you're going to, the seeds could be viable and then you'll have ryegrass seed germinating and, and becoming a weed problem. So let's talk about that set for a second. Cause I'd like to, I mean, certainly there are, there are going to be people interested in this that, that have never grown rye to that stage. Can you describe how you tell it's in what stage? Yeah. You just have to, um, I mean, it all happens pretty quick. So, you know, it goes through, um, like a flower stage where it'll, it, you'll see, it'll be shedding pollen. Um, I think it's called anthesis. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right. Anthesis where, um, you actually see the little pollen like fingers coming out of the, the, the rye flower. And, you know, if you shake the plant, pollen's going to go everywhere as well. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, the seed will start to form in that flower and you just have to like kind of pull it apart 
and examine the seed formation. Um, and then the seed goes through different stages. The early stage of the seed is, is called like the, the milk stage. And there's probably more stages to that as well, where it's kind of like real watery and then it gets kind of milky and then it gets doughy and then it gets hard. So once it's in the dough or hard stage, the seed's going to be, um, you know, viable. So that's, that's what you want to avoid. How long, I mean, I guess it probably varies season to season, but how long is that window? Yeah, it's probably like one week or so, uh, one week window. Which is probably, I mean, on the surface, it sounds like a big deal, but if you're, if it's the spring and you're eager to get in there, you're watching it pretty closely, I imagine. Yeah, and it can be hard to time your transplant production um, with the maturity. So, you know, sometimes you just have, you know, it's key to, to, to get all that timing correctly, but you might have to, like, hold your transplants a little longer sometimes to, to make sure that things are, are timed correctly. And you can, like, withhold fertilizer so they don't, you know, kind of overdo it in the cells, overgrow the cells. So you So in that situation, are you... Um, potting stuff up or are you trying to grow everything in slightly bigger cells in case you need to or what's your what's your sort of plan there what's your how do you navigate that yeah I mean um, with so with um, tomatoes peppers and eggplants those are all potted up into I used to do four inch pots but now I, I use um, all these speedling flats so hey y'all just popping in here real quick speedling flats are actually the name brand if you want to hunt those down uh they're like little white trays they have sort of a pyramid shaped cell uh yeah anyway back to john um i pot those up into three inch cells and the speedlings and the speedling trays it's like these styrofoam planting trays um so yeah, I mean, you can hold them in there a little longer if you need to. Usually they won't suffer too much, especially if you withhold the fer fertilizer. But all the tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants are all planted by hand with the trowel. So um, to do that, so after you crimp, um, I'll go out and I'll usually pre-irrigate because a lot of times the soil will be hard as a rock. Um, and I used to use a special bulb planter that I got from A.M. Leonard that allowed you to take a chunk of soil out and then, um, you know, it was a, like a bowl planter you could use upright, but they're not making it anymore, so I can't get it. Um, and, and the workers that I uh, have worked with in, in the past have, have liked the trowel actually better. So I just pre-irrigate and then I go out there with the, with the little hand trowel and, um, you know, make a hole right underneath the drip tape where the emitter is and then, um, just plop the plant in. Um, usually someone will be pulling the plants out ahead of someone planting them. So you have someone popping the plants out and someone going behind them and, uh, and troweling them into the soil. Now with the um, peppers and eggplant or things that are gonna be in the ground for a really long period of time. So like the peppers and eggplants will be in the ground six and a half months here in our climate. So for those things, um, you only get about six weeks of weed control um, with, with a crimped cover crop of cereal rye. After six weeks, the, the rye grass starts decomposing and then you get weeds growing through it. Um, so with the crops that are going to be in the ground a really long period of time, what I'll do is I'll take a, um, a manure spreader and I'll add a layer of leaves or wood chips on top of the um, crimped rye grass. And then the depth you can control the depth very well with the manure spreader. Um, it's just based on how fast you go with the tractor. And the manure spreader straddles one bed perfectly so the wheels are in the furrows. And um, I can apply, you know, two inches of leaves um, to a quarter acre in about four hours with the manure spreader. And then um, uh, you can put the leaves out before you plant or after you plant. I kind of prefer putting the leaves out before I plant. And um, if the crop's going to be in there for like peppers and eggplants, I might add two to three inches of leaves, and that'll give me about six, that six months of weed control. And then um, with some crops that, you know, 
kind of the second succession of watermelons and second succession of cantaloupes and sweet potatoes. Um, you know, you have to crimp the cover crop when it's, when it's mature. And a lot of times those aren't going to be planted until maybe two, sometimes three weeks after you've crimped. Um, so if you put those plants in the ground, um, you're only going to have maybe three weeks of weed control before the weeds start coming through, which is just not enough. So with some of those crops, I'll add, you know, an inch of leaves, um, which will give me, I don't need six months of weed control with them because like, for example, sweet potatoes are going to cover the ground and they're going to do a pretty good job of weed control. Um, but I do need, you know, six weeks of weed control for those. But um, I've already lost that amount of weed control by, by planting um, several weeks after I've crimped. So um, I'll add an inch or two of leaves depending on how much weed control I need. I can just do the exact amount um, required and that will give me the weed control necessary for those crops. The leaves are an interesting innovation. Uh, I have a couple questions about them. Do, the first would be, does it add, adding that dark layer of matter Presuming, I mean, I guess leaves would probably be darker than your average uh, sort of cover crop, right? So does that help increase the soil temperature a little bit? Um, I wish it did, but I don't think it does. Um, that would be, it'd be a good test. I mean, I think it's just such an insulating factor having, you know, the mulch over the soil. I don't think that that heat actually gets down into it. But if you do add the leaves, I should add this, it's important to... Um, you know, I don't add the leaves directly after crimping because right after you crimp, all that cover crop is kind of green and fresh. Um, and if you add the leaves directly after crimping, you know, it's just going to cause the ryegrass to decompose quicker. So I kind of like the ryegrass to kind of dry out a little bit and get a little more carbonaceous and then add the leaves to the top of it. But there's like a, it's cool because there's a synergistic effect that I think happens because the ryegrass alone, the ryegrass mulch alone is only going to give you, you know, six weeks of weed control. And if you applied, you know, two inches of leaves, that's only going to give you, you know, a couple weeks of weed control. But then when you combine the two, you get this like super long weed control. And I think it, it has to do with, you know, the ryegrass keeping the leaves, um, you know, up off the ground. And then the leaves kind of like lock down and key into the ryegrass and, um, you know, kind of fill in those gaps. Uh, it's just, yeah, there's some kind of synergy that happens. Um, to give you this really long weed control effect. Um, oh, I should mention this too. When I before I plant my cover crop into those raised beds, I like to stale seed bed the raised beds. So um, you know, you form your raised beds, and then I'll go over those raised beds. I'll let a rain come, let the weeds come up, and then once the weeds come up. I'll cultivate uh, those with just my cultivation equipment. I've got a toolbar that has um, sweeps, side knives for the sides of the raised beds, sweeps for the tops of the raised beds. Oh, not sweeps, but um, S-tines. S-tines for the top of the raised beds, side knives for the sides of the raised beds, and then sweeps for the furrows. So the entire raised bed gets cultivated real shallowly, and then I'll plant the cover crop into moisture. And that's key because you want uh, the surface to be dry, but you want the moisture to be down in there. So the, you want your cover crop to germinate and start growing um, before those weeds have a chance to grow. So when you plant into moisture, your cover crop will come up, but the surface is going to be dry and cultivated so your weeds won't come up. And then once your cover crop starts growing, it's going to, especially with ryegrass, it'll have that allelopathic effect where it emits those chemicals. And even after a week of growth of that, there's chemicals going into the soil that are going to prevent any weeds from growing. So that gives you a really weed-free cover crop. Um, and if it's a weed-free cover crop, then you're going to have, basically you're doing the cultivation then, so you don't have weeds coming up after you've crimped in the summertime. And did you say I, that you're using um, a broadcaster for that, or are you drilling those seeds? How are you getting that cover crop in? after on the second round yeah just broadcasting it over the raised beds um yeah and then um and then so broadcast so scale seed bedding broadcasting the cover crop seeds and then going back and re-bedding to help incorporate those cover crop seeds 
And the timing is also critical with the ryegrass because if you plant it too early uh, in the fall or late summer, what's going to happen is um, any uh, summer annual weeds that germinate with your cover crop will have a chance to go to seed if you plant it too early. Um, and if those things grow up with your cover crop and go to seed, for example, like if pigweed germinates with your cover crop and matures enough to go to seed, then your, all those weed seeds are going to be in there after you crimp. Um, and if you plant it too late, then what happens is, is uh, um, it's just going to grow very slowly, which is going to allow a lot of the winter annual weeds to basically start growing with it and then they're going to compete with it and then you're going to have winter annual weeds going to seed. So there's like this fine line of like planting it too early and planting it too late. So for my climate, um, September 15th is like the magic date. So I'm always trying to plant as close as possible to September 15th, but no later than October 1st. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, timing it then and then timing it on the, uh, on the crimper. That adds a, another level of complexity. Yeah, it's all about the timing. And if, you know, you miss the timing, it's like, just wait till next year. <laughs> right. So I want to ask another question about those leaves. How, how are you getting, where are you getting your leaves? And uh, yeah, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. If there's an expense involved or. Yeah, at, when I was at Clemson, um, we were close to the, we were in the, the city center, um, so it was really easy to get leaves. The city of Clemson would bring me as many leaves as I wanted, and I had, you know, several hundred cubic yards probably of leaves that they would dump every year. I basically just ran out of space to at, at the farm there to um, house the leaves. So I was mulching everything with leaves. I mean, I was, I was you know, even with things that I wasn't no-tilling, um, I would mulch like potatoes. I would mulch, put mulch out in the in the fall for um, beds that I wanted to plant really early with um, onions. So I would, you know, just mulch like a whole quarter acre and then put the onions in there. Um, I'd mulch that in the fall, and then in the springtime, I could just drop onions right through that mulch. Um, and I would mulch flat. I would just mulch as much as I could because I just had this unlimited resource and it was free. But then um, coming to Wild Hope Farm, we're about 10 miles from the city of Chester. And the city of Chester does collect leaves, but they don't um, drop them off for free. So they've got a, a you know, um, they stockpile them kind of in the city center and like a, in a mulch yard there. And... Um, Last year, I bought leaves from them, and they weren't very expensive. Um, I probably spent a thousand dollars on leaves, but we had to buy them, and then I had to hire a dump truck driver to go there and pick them up. So I think we probably brought um, five loads, dump truck loads of leaves out to the farm. Just hired him for about a half a day. Wow, that's great! And you felt like that was a that's still a good expense. Yeah, I think it was cost effective um, for all the weed control that we got from it. And then you also, you're also getting the nutrients. Um, obviously, you know, you want to get it for free. This year, um, you know, now that we've been here longer, I was kind of, you know, I've been able to like connect with the utility pruners. So I got probably over 100 cubic yards of wood chips from the utility pruners this year. Um, so that's already gone out over our garlic. I like to use a manure spreader. I'll plant the garlic and then I'll use a manure spreader to put the mulch out over the top of it. And then the garlic will push through um, the, the mulch. Um, wood chips, of course, aren't as good as leaves. Um, if you use wood chips and you till them in um, after you're finished with your crop, then what you really need to do is plant a cover crop of cow peas. Cowpeas can tolerate the um, immobilization of nitrogen that the wood chips will do, and then they're going to add a massive amount of nitrogen to the soil. Um, so you won't have a lot of nutrient deficiencies um, with the uh, crop following the cowpeas. That's a that's that's a great tip. The um, so you're not using any compost on on those beds. So your expenses, even with the even buying in the leaves is really just cover crop seed and leaves. Yeah, yep. Um, 
And we do compost some at the farm. Um, and at Clemson, we, we composted uh, wood chips with um, food waste from the cafeterias. But all of our composting here and, and at Clemson is basically just to um, generate heat for our greenhouses because we have a system to extract the heat from the compost piles um, and then use that to heat the greenhouses. Nice. So then on the new farm, I'm, I'm presuming that you're using that compost in the places that you're not having, that you're not doing the no-till. Yeah, last year we used um, compost to basically, I had a, I needed potassium out in, in, in the fields. So I put the, the compost out on the cover crop, um, on the ryegrass cover crop, just to kind of fertilize that cover crop. But I think it was interesting. I, I put the, the the compost out too late in the year. You really need to fertilize your cover crop when it's you know pretty young. I would say under a foot, um, even or even younger. You know before you even plant, it's probably better to to get your fertilizer out, your fertility out there before it's even planted. Um, but putting the compost out late, and I put it out probably you know a half inch thick or so. But I think that might have added to the mulching effect of the no-till. Um, because there was like this layer of compost down there and then I crimped so I think that could have added and made the you know the weed control effect of the no-till even even better nice so what if wh I'm sure this has happened to you over time are, are there any s tips for situations in which somebody gets a cover crop in but the weeds may not be under control or, or the cover crop comes back up what is your sort of contingency plan when you have a, a crimped cover crop, but it gets weedy. Ooh, yeah, that's, you know, that's the problem with no-till. You really have to recognize that your cover crop isn't dense enough and it's not going to do its job before you even um, plant into it. So, like, if I have an area, you know, if the cover crop doesn't look good enough, I definitely don't no-till it. You just got to mow it down and, and till it in and start over. Um, so you need like that right amount of biomass. However, if you've got a manure spreader or got a way to add leaves to your, to your cover crop, that can make up the difference. So even, you know, now that I'm doing the manure spreader um, with the leaves, I can, um, you know, I can see, I can target the field if I've got this area where the cover crop is weak, I can just, you know, drive the manure spreader out there and fix the problem with that. Um, you could, the manure spreader will also allow you to crimp early. And I've crimped up to a month early by adding leaves on top of the, um, the rye grass after I've crimped it after, on top of the cereal rye after crimping and that prevents the cereal rye from popping back up. Um, so if you need to get out there earlier for some reason, um, and I, the experiment I did with that, I planted broccoli and, and kale um, into the crimped cover crop. Is there an option for getting in, uh, getting in earlier? So a lot of these, whenever you do the crimper method, a lot of the sort of um, issues with it, I guess, that some people may have is that it, it does push your planting dates back a little bit because it cools, it keeps this cool, the soil so cool. So it's a little harder to get in early. Uh, is there anything that you're doing or sort of working on or have thoughts about for getting in earlier? Yeah, I mean, by adding the, the mulch to the top of it, you can crimp much earlier, but you're still going to have the delayed effect because the soil isn't heating up. Um, you know, you're going to have you know, it's going to delay the crop growth because you're not getting the soil temperature that you need to speed up the, the crop growth. And like when I planted the broccoli and the kale, you know, I was planting it, you know, um, at the end of, when was it? It was like um, end of March, early April is when I was planting that, that um, broccoli and kale into the crimped cover crop. So I crimped it really early, put the mulch on top of it to keep it from popping back up and then planted, um, uh, the kale and the broccoli into there, but um, because the sun wasn't heating the soil up, I had issues with like cold damaging the broccoli and the kale, which normally doesn't happen for me when I plant to bare soil situations. So not only will it delay the, the crop growth, but if you're really pushing the limits, it can, you know, you can get cold damage on your crops. 
Is there any reason you wouldn't use uh, compost over top of the crimped rye? Um, no, and I tried that, and that worked well too. Um, probably worked better um, because then what you can do it makes it because when you when you crimp it early, um, what happens is is uh, when you plant through, like say you crimp it early, and then you add the mulch on top of it. And then you're having to pull that mulch back to put your plants into the crimped ryegrass. When you pull that mulch back, you're you're then exposing those leaves, which are then going to allow the ryegrass to grow through that little area that you pulled the mulch back from. Um, so if you put compost on on top of it, you can actually just plant into the compost, and then not have to disturb the that layer that's that's preventing the light from um, from hitting those leaves. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's really neat. And there's no issue with the decomposing matter underneath the compost up against the plants? Not, yeah, not at all. I didn't see any at all. And actually, you know, um, if you plant, a, you know, like if you, for example, grew a ryegrass cover crop um, and tried to terminate that and till it into the ground really early in the springtime, um, you would definitely get problems, at least in our area, with this uh insect called cabbage maggots. Um, they infect not only cabbage but any brass, they, they infect almost any plant. And it's um, a fly larva and they're attracted to freshly decomposing organic matter. So if you till that ryegrass in, they're going to smell it out, come and lay their eggs, and then the larva is going to start feeding on that freshly decomposing organic matter. and that's basically going to, um, and then once you put your transplants in the ground, they're just going to move from that fresh organic matter right to your transplant roots. It took me a couple years to figure this out, but you pull your, your, your plant up and you'd see all these maggots basically feeding on it and your plant dies several days later. It's really difficult to deal with. But um, I always plant now my early spring crops into a winter killed cover crop. So I'll plant cowpeas in the fall, let it winter kill, and then all my um, early spring stuff go into that that area, but it, with the the crimp the early crimp stuff, um, you know, you had all this fresh decomposing organic matter because you crimped that cover crop, and then you put the mulch on top of it or the compost on top of it, and you had all this freshly decomposing organic matter, but there wasn't a single cabbage maggot issue that I had with any of the transplants. And what I did is I noticed I went out there early one morning. And I noticed that there were all these um, uh, fungus gnats that were laying their eggs um, on the in the mulch on top of the crimped cereal rye. And as soon as the fungus gnats went down and laid their eggs, all these predatory mites would come up from the mulch and consume the eggs. It was almost instantaneous. So I think what was happening is the the cabbage maggots were probably coming in and laying their eggs, and the predatory mites from that mulch are basically coming up and consuming those eggs so the cabbage maggots never really got a chance to, to do any damage. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, that's that's a great, uh, it's, a, it's a nice benefit of those beneficials. Yeah, yeah. So you don't, you know, in bare soil situations, you're not going to have any predatory mites because they're, the predatory mites are going to be feeding on um, fungal mites and, or, or, or uh, yeah, they're going to be feeding on you know, all different kinds of things, not just whatever is laying their eggs in there. So you have that, that army of, of predators at, at, at your disposal. What about other pests? Was there anything, I mean, have you noticed any other drops in pest pressure from, uh, from this system? Yeah, this year was the first year we planted um, scallions into the no-till system. And normally when I plant scallions, later into the year when it's hot, um, I get a massive amount of problems with thrips. Hey y'all real quick, thrips are just a tiny bug, a tiny pest uh, that often spread plant disease and they can multiply asexually and ergo super fast. They also suck the life out of plants. I don't know, it, it's kind of for that reason I think thrips would also make a really good thrash metal band name. Uh, I don't know, just throwing that out there in case you're needing one. Anyway, just saying. Back to Sean. And these scallions looked gorgeous, like all the way through. I couldn't believe how long they, they, how how well they looked. You know, late into the season, I've never seen them look that great that time of year. And um, 
definitely attribute that to the to the mulch. Um, also, probably uh, like planting cucumbers um, into the no-till, I see less problem problems with um, cucumber beetles. I don't know what's um, controlling the cucumber beetles in there, but um, definitely helps with cucumber beetles. Uh, trying to think. It seems like the squash did better. It, another good benefit of the no-till is that it keeps the, your fruits a lot cleaner. It's like cucumber, squash, zucchini, cantaloupes, watermelons, all those things that used to just get filthy, dirty, growing them on bare ground. Um, you know, they stay really clean on, on the no-till. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a, that's a nice advantage. Saves a lot of time cleaning. Hey, you all, last interruption. If you're enjoying this podcast or any of these podcasts and it's bringing you some amount of value, please consider signing up for the Patreon page. It's linked in the show notes. It can be as little as $2 a month. But when each of these episodes costs us, I don't know, over $100 to produce, it keeps us going. This sustains us. Or I'll also throw this out there. If you're a relevant business and want to advertise, we can offer you a pretty sweet deal and grandfather you in at a reasonable rate. So, holla. Back to Sean. We kind of touched on this, but is there are there any are there any pitfalls here? I'm thinking perhaps somebody you know maybe getting a little overzealous with different cover crop varieties, or maybe not thinking about soil temperature, which we sort of talked about. But is there anything that you can think of here that uh, people really really need to consider when it comes to trying a similar or the same style? Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to start small um, and, and work your way up. I mean, if you have any kind of perennial weed issue, um, you definitely can't, can't do it. If, if, you know, if you don't know how to get your weeds under control in a, in a um, tillage organic system, I definitely wouldn't um, switch to no-till thinking you're going to get them under control. You definitely have to, um, to be able to grow a really vigorous, strong cover crop um, and you want that cover crop to be really weed free. Um, if you can't do that, uh, I definitely wouldn't try it. Uh, another good consideration is you have to plant, um, you know, a massive amount of cover crop seeds out there. Like for cereal rye, I like to put out 150 pounds per acre. Um, I used to do less than that, but um, I'm, the more I do it, the more I realize you really just want to go with that rate. Um, and yeah, that's probably the most important thing. Really high density cover crops. The cover crops need to be fertilized really well. They need to be weed free. Um, I mean, I remember listening to Jeff Moyer talk about this um, a few years back and he, he was saying the same thing. You really need to focus on, you know, you're, you're growing a cover crop at that point and you're you gotta treat your cover crop like a cash crop. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, it it's, uh, it's gonna ultimately, save you hmm, especially if you're if you're doing it instead of compost um save you money and energy but it does require a little bit more focus and proper execution to really get the most out of it yeah absolutely absolutely and i like to plant my my winter cover crops like my cereal rye that i planted this year um i you know that was planted after uh a cover crop of cowpeas. So the cowpeas are like providing the fertility for that, that cereal rye. Um, so the cereal rye would get a lot bigger and denser and have, have that biomass that you need. And if you didn't do that, if I didn't do the, the cowpeas prior to the, to the rye grass, the cereal rye, I would, I would probably maybe even, you know, fertilize or put compost out on the, on the cereal rye to, to get it strong enough and, and dense enough. Are there any experiments with different um, cover crops that you've got in mind going forward? Yeah, I've been trying to figure out a summer cover crop that I can crimp um, to plant fall cover to, to plant fall vegetables into. That's kind of like my my golden ticket that I've been working on because if I can do that, then you know that expands. You know, can almost double the amount of um, no-till work that we're doing. Um, so I've been close every year. Some years have been better than others, other years. Every year I've been trying it and every, this year I did something a little different, but it seems 
like the best way to go is to go with the um either a mix of sun hemp and uh Japanese millet. Um sun hemp at about fifty pounds per acre and um Japanese millet at about thirty pounds per acre and uh, broadcast those. The problem is is that Japanese millet sun hemp you can pretty much crimp that at, at almost any stage and it'll die. Um Japanese millet, um, that terminates pretty well too, but um, it has to be mature enough. But it has this very short window where the seeds are going to be viable. <laughs> and the, um, uh, so if you, it's, it's, and I've made the mistake probably two years now, where if you crimp it too late, the, you're going to have viable seeds that are going to germinate. So you have to be very careful to like crimp that on time. Um, it's probably maybe like a week or even less when it goes from, you know, flower to like viable seed. And it's a really short crop. I think it's like after 50 days after planting, it'll be, um, you'll have viable seeds with the Japanese millet. Um, another option would be to just do an even higher density of, um, sun hemp and then let that get really tall and grow it out for several months or more and um and then crimp that but i think the key to the to to the fall crimping with the summer cover crops is like doing that stale seed bed technique and maybe stale seed bedding several times before you plant your um summer cover crop um the problem that i had this year as i planted the summer cover crop into moisture and about 30% of the of the japanese millet came up um, and probably 30% of the sun hemp came up, um, but then it didn't rain for three weeks. So then finally we got a rain and the rest of the seed came up. So I had the age class of the cover crop. It was at two different stages, which made it impossible. You know, if I crimped it, um, the, you know, the stuff that was, that came up three weeks later wouldn't have died. Is there any reason, so I'm thinking buckwheat wouldn't be thick enough, it kind of disintegrates, but what about Sudan grass and some of your more common summer covers? Yeah, someone told me that Sudan grass didn't work. Um, I think I saw some research online that showed that Sudan grass didn't, didn't work. Um, I haven't tried it myself, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah, if one of those high biomass cover crops worked i should try an experiment and just see if, see if i can get it to work but um yeah just reading what other people have done i don't think it works well sean that's that i really appreciate your time thank you so much for coming and chatting with us about this yeah thanks this is exciting i'm hoping more people get into it um i mean it's saved us so much time and it's been such a, a blessing uh, being able to do the no-till um really hope more farmers take it on and we can kind of figure out ways to to do more of it all right you all if you enjoyed that episode make sure to follow wild hope farm also check out sean's book the bio-integrated farm from chelsea green which has a lot of practical permaculture information about heating greenhouses naturally and etc Please sign up for the Patreon page or at least share these episodes. Talk about them with your friends, share them in your Facebook groups, all those good things. Subscribe to the podcast, leave a comment, whatever you can do to help us grow this uh, exposure of this thing. You're awesome. Otherwise, your sort of no till challenging fact of the day comes from a talk Dr. Elaine Ingham did at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. Quote, there is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants for the next 10 billion years. End quote. So our charge as growers is to get the right biology in there to extract those nutrients and make them bioavailable to our freaking broccoli. Yeah. All right, y'all. Let that one weigh on you for a minute. Till next week. Thanks for listening. Bye.